Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's event. I would like to begin by giving just a few administrative stuff just to make sure everyone is on the same page. As always, please uh, keep your microphones muted so that we can hear the presenter. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand virtually. I believe all of you know how to do that already. And also there is a chat. I'm going to put it here. Chat is here so that you are free to also put your questions in there. And then in that way, we can make sure that we have an organized uh, session. So now that the administrative stuff is out of the way. Today, you will have the pleasure of meeting a person which has extensive knowledge and extensive experience in software development. In fact, as I have already mentioned to a number of you, not so long ago, I had the opportunity to work with this person. I had the opportunity to learn from his experience, and we had a lot of very interesting <laughs> conversations and, and debates. Today, you are actually going to have the opportunity to meet Kenny, and you're going to have the opportunity to learn from his experience about many topics, but more specifically, mob programming. So with that said, Kenny, the floor is all yours. Cool. Hi. Uh, thank you. Very kind words on breath. Oh my God, you make me <laughs> embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to get my sh the screen sharing ready. Uh, however that works. Do you see my this desktop? Allow. Uh, uh, wait. Desktop. Uh, share screen. So, do you see my screen now? Cool. Let me just press that button. You still see my screen, right? Cool. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Yes, uh, I don't see you right at the moment. So if anyone nods or anything, I won't notice. I have my uh, presentation notes in front of me. So, uh, but uh, yes, hi, welcome. And thanks again, Umberto, for having me and, and sharing these kind words with me. Uh, I'm happy to be here and happy to talk to you. And uh, uh, just so you know, I don't see the chat right now. So if you have a question, to me about the current object and you don't think it can wait till the end, feel free to stop me, uh, Umberto, because I won't see your hands being raised right now because I have. I uh, can let you know, I can let you know, Kenny, if there's yeah. a hand or a question. Yeah, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's start. Um, so yes, welcome. Uh, I'm here to, uh, Umberto has invited me to talk about mob programming and that is a subject that is, dear to my heart to some extent uh, but before we get started with uh, more programming i'm going to present it myself uh, which Umberto already did me and Umberto, we work together at parakeet i'm still working at parakeet uh, it's a lovely company to work at work at and we're doing we're unlocking doors with phones if you don't know what parakeet is i'm also uh, the organizer for a meetup group called coca heads it's the local iOS meetup group uh, where I uh, make events, which has been uh, not many since the pandemic, of course, but uh, it's a thing. And it's uh, if you're interested in iOS development, you should definitely go to meetup and search for Cocoa Heads and you will find it. And if you want to speak at it, that will make me even more happy because uh, I will make sure that you get a, a stage to stay to be on and speak. I'm also the author of a website called programmingbooks.dev. Uh, it's for anyone. It's a website that I'm trying to make it easy for people to uh, read programming books, basically, to uh, become better in the craft by reading more and making that easy, as easy as possible. But enough about that. So what I have on the agenda for today is five things. I'm going to explain what more programming is for those who doesn't know. I'm going to go through why we want to do more programming or why we do more programming. And I'm going to share my journey with more programming, uh, which was longer than I now looking back at it, which was longer than I realized. And, and the struggles with more programming and the results we have 
gotten with more programming. So the question is, what is more programming? Uh, and for this definition, I'm going to head to uh, a quote from a book called Software Teaming that is written by Woody Sul and Kevin Meadows. Uh, Woody Sul is basically the guy who kind of started the whole more programming movement in a sense. Uh, so I felt it appropriate to take his definition from uh, of what it is, and is that the whole team works together on the same thing at the same time in the same space at the same computer. And this might sound ridiculous and it might sound easy, but it's like Kent Beck once said, uh, that ideas that are ridiculous and dumb are the ones you should try and explore because all the the good obvious ideas have already been tried so this is a kind of a stupid idea in a sense and it got explored and it's pretty sweet so for those of you who don't know how more programming works it's easy to say just sit around the computer all together but it is almost that easy but it can it's not as simple because there are a couple of things you need to do to make it work at all and the first thing you need one driver and by driver you mean the person sitting by the keyboard typing in the uh, the code basically to the computer and you only ever have one of those the rest of the people is usually what you call navigators and these are the people who are uh, coming with the ideas and suggestions of what to do and the dri the driver though should try to re restrain themselves from coming with too many ideas and suggestions because you don't want this is not a one man show right so the driver should listen and interpret what they say and ask for clarification and put what they hear on the screen and the navigators should do the navigating and then have mostly of the most of the discussions uh, and it's also important to rotate the driver regularly and even more important is to take breaks. So that is how more programming works uh, on the most simple terms. I just want to make that clear so you have some kind of reference when we go through this. Because uh, please stop me if something is unclear or weird because I've done this for quite some time so I might have forgotten how it feels to be uh, inexperienced with these terminologies and uh, way of doing stuff. So please stop me if there's anything you don't understand. Uh, so let's go on to why you should do, or why anyone should do uh, more programming. And the question is, if you want to be agile, more programming is a pretty good choice uh, to do. Agile is one of those words that I'm sure that many of you have heard. And I'm sure also that many of you might not really not really know what it means, actually. And some of you might think you know what it means, and some of you might actually know what it means. And because it's a very it's a word that has been diluted throughout the years. And there is only one source of truth when it comes to the uh, to the to being agile and there's the agile manifesto and the agile manifesto is quite simple it's four values so that means four things that should help you make decisions uh, during your uh, as a developer or as a team or as a, a company and 12 principles that you should try to adhere to as well as you can. And I'm bringing this up because uh, mob programming is pretty well aligned with uh, being agile because mob programming is a practice that derives from the values and principles of the agile manifesto. So let's take a little closer look at how we get to this uh, conclusion. So one of the four values is individuals and interactions over process and tools. And it's simply put like this. 
if you put all people together in the same space on the same computer at the same time, you will have individuals and you will have interactions. And hopefully the tools, the, the processes and tools will be secondary. You will still need processes and tools, but the individuals interaction are always important and where the stuff is happening. And more programming is this quite clearly in my book, right? Uh, a typical example is in a lot of companies today, uh, or a lot of things, you use something called pull request, and you send away those pull requests to a person, and they create a review on that pull request, and then and accept or reject, and then this pull request get back merged into the code base, blah, blah, blah. That's a lot of process and a lot of tools. In more programming, you don't do that because everybody who is interested in this piece of code and has anything to do with it isn't there right now. So you're doing the review and the accepting and rejecting of ideas in real time, face to face as individuals and interacting with each other. So that's kind of how that works. Then you have two principles that are very, very, of course, connected to uh, more programming. And that is business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. If you work at some companies, it, it might not be that uncommon that you're not actually interacting with other developers or other business people that often. Uh, at some people, you could go days without really talking with other people. And the Agile Manifesto says that that should not happen. You should do it daily. And if you're working together, then you're doing it daily. By, automatically it's automatically happening right and this is also quite important because you have the business people part of this as well and though it business people <laughs> whatever that kind of means uh, might not want to join the program because it's may be too technical or they have other stuff to do and that might be true it would be great if they did but that's not always the reality but when you have the mob, at least the business people have a single source to like a group that is together to go to when they need to talk to the developers or the developers need to talk to business. Then you have everybody in the same spot in the same place. And you you will hopefully not get uh, misinformation by information spreading from person to person to person is a direct contact. And it's very convenient, of course, for the business people to be like talking to one group of people at the same time and convince their ideas and the developers can respond together and no one will be left out. Uh, and the last principle is what I think might be one of the most important parts of the Agile Manifesto. And this is, it says, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. And it, it's hard to argue against this, like, because even when we have face-to-face -face conversation, we will have miscommunication. And if you do any other form of oh, communication, that miscommunication and misunderstanding will just increase. Uh, and when you're doing more programming, it's like you will, it, it, it builds on face-to-face -face conversations and you will avoid mis this mis misinformation and misunderstandings that can be quite nasty if you're uh, unlucky. I myself have been part of a situation that uh, I can share. And that was, I worked at a company where we did a lot of pull requests and pull uh, and reviews and so, uh, so to speak. And a colleague of mine sent a review to me and asked me to look at the code. I did, it was mostly fine. I had some, uh, I had some opinions about it and I put these opinions in text. And when I put my opinions in text, uh, I usually try to be concise. I want it to be short and clear. And what I also do is I like to put references to my ideas. So if I see something that is uh, not great in the code, I usually uh, send a point a reference to which code smell. Uh, if you don't know what a code smell is, it's just like there's a, it's a terminology of 
uh, when the code smells bad, like uh, you can be like, huh, this smells bad. And there's names for basically every kind of problem that can adhere, that can be found in code. So I usually reference one of those. And I also reference what it could be a reasonable kind of refactoring. Uh, and I did this in this case. And I referenced the refactoring call extract function, which is, of course, a very simple one. Like you, you just extract a function from something. The person, the person on the receiving end got quite upset because they thought that I was condescending, which was of course not what I wanted to do at all. Uh, and once we started talking to each other again, like we did the face-to-face, -face, it was just clear that this was just like, this is just how I like to do it. And that's, and since they, and they didn't like the way it was done. And it was, it was something that could be avoided if we just did it face to face, where I could just said like, "Hey, maybe we could do an extract function here," and then you say like, "Ah, oh, yeah, that's a good idea," and then we could be done with it. Instead, we had uh, uh, instead someone had to get uh, angry and offended when it was not needed. Uh, so I do like face to face conversation because it does avoid a lot of these uh, misunderstandings a lot, and more programming is. It's doing that automatically. So I'm going to run through my journey and I'm going to do my best to be quick about it. Uh, but the first time I heard about more programming was at a conference called Ship It that my previous company that I worked at was organizing. And it was this guy there uh, who did a presentation on more programming. And it was fascinating. Uh, for two reasons, he was, he was an incredible storyteller because he had been being a dungeon master in Dungeon Dragons for like 30 years or something like that. He was, he was great at telling stories. And he told a story about his company and how they did more programming. And I was hooked. I got inspired. And so did, I think everybody who was there got quite inspired because like he was very good at talking. It was so interesting. It was like sitting in a chair, kind of reading a story and from a book. And he set the scene and it was great. So at the company I worked in, we were like, hey, we gotta try this. We gotta, we gotta, this, this, sounds, this sounds pretty great. And we did. So what you see right now is the picture of my first mob programming session ever. And it's from March, 2018. And here we are, four people sitting in front of a couple of computers trying to mob programming. This did, not go well, actually. Uh, it, I have not strong memories from this, but I do remember this. And it was, it was a failure, I would say. Because even though this guy, Lennart, had con convinced me that this was a good thing, I knew nothing about how to actually do it. I had no idea. Though we were pretty good pair programmers, all of us, we had no idea how to do more programming. So we sat here and we were kind of clueless. And I think this was one or maybe twice the only times we attempted it at the company because uh, it didn't stick, sadly. Uh, but I was still convinced though that this, it had, this thing had something to it so if you remember, I'm, an, I'm still the organizer for the Cocoa Heads meetup. So what I did as my next step is that I did an event where uh, we did a code kata together, uh, the whole meetup group, everybody who came, and we did it mob programming style. And it worked much better. Uh, here, I learned some important lessons as well it went, it went fine but i had at this point i had a little bit more a little bit more better understanding of what it is i had the concept of driver and navigator better and stuff like that and it went okay and people liked it we sadly haven't attempted it since and that's something i want to change uh, but it was it was quite a success we struggled a lot with some stupid stuff uh, but we'll get to that later at some point, I started working at Parakey, and 
there was no not a strong culture of pair programming. So since I came from a culture of pair programming, this was something that I wanted to inspire to do. So we built a little pair programming station up on the, we set up a desk, a screen, and a couple of keyboards so people could take the computers to the station and they could sit together and, and program. It was it was a mild success, I would say. Some people use it for pair programming. A lot of times it stood empty. Sometimes just people chose to sit there to come to be away from the other people in the office. Uh, but it was a mild, mild success, uh, actually. It was not used. But we'll get back to that. That was just to kind of warm up the current company to this idea of working several people on the same computer. So that was the first step. The second step at pair programming uh, at uh, Parakey, my current company, is that we set up a Code Kata Mob Dojo. And it's basically, if you don't know what a Code Kata is, it's basically a small problem that you solve with code. And you're supposed to solve them, do them over and over again to discover uh, how you can solve problems in many different ways and learn to solve, like to teach, learn ideas, uh, how to program. Uh, it's a good, fun thing to do. So we did that at uh, Parakey uh, for every second week or something like that, an hour or two. It was pretty fun, but I, as well here, I learned a lot from this. And one less, like I have a strong memory of a thing I, I learned here. Uh, and this, I guess, I learned it and I have relearned it a couple of times. And it was basically, we had this great idea that uh, we should attempt to solve a uh, kata in a programming language, in a new programming language, a programming language that none of us actually know about. But hey, we were like four or five developers, and we were somewhat experienced, done many different programming languages over the years. And like, hey, let's do this in Rust, and we did try. And it was kind of a disaster because this is the, my first lesson where I learned that if no one in the group really knows what to do next, you should probably stop the mob because there's nothing that is quite as boring as looking at people doing research to find something out. That is just boring and unproductive. And that's kind of what happened here when we were just trying to figure out how to create an array in Rust. How does memory management work in Rust? All these things, and it was a disaster. But it was an important lesson to learn. So at this point, and uh, I'll jump back, wait. At this point, uh, we were still not, I, I still believe in more programming, but I was not super, it was, I was not passionate about it, I guess, at some point yet. Something changed when I read this book. I don't know if you see my webcam, but it's The Art of Agile Development. And this book has a section about more programming. And it was the thing that convinced me that we should really try this and we should really learn it because of this little section here. Uh, I'm going to read all of it uh, for you. Uh, so bear with me because I think this is the best part of the book. Uh, so mob programming works because it's easy mode for collaboration. So much of agile centers around communication and collaboration is the secret sauce that make agile more effective than other approaches. And mob programming takes a lot of the agile collaboration practices irrelevant. They're simply not needed when you mob. Stand-up meetings, gone. Collective code ownership, automatic. Team room, a no-brainer. Task planning, still useful, but kind of unnecessary. So, so when I first heard of mob programming, I poo-pooed it. I get the same benefits from having a cross-functional team, a team room, pairing, frequent pair switching, a good collaboration, I said. And I was right. 
Mobbing doesn't get you anything you don't already get on a good team. But it's so easy. Getting people to pair and collaborate well is hard. Mobbing is practically automatic. And these, these words in this thing, it was really like, this is what kind of made it uh, click for me. Because I spent so much time trying to get people to pair, having collective team ownership and collaborating and, and everything and get this uh, to work. But it's hard. Like it is it's really hard, right? Like, so, and here he says like, He's acknowledging that it's hard to do all this stuff by saying like, but if you do more programming, it's easy. So like, I want the, and for me, it's like, I want the easy way. I want to do all this stuff. I want all the benefits in the easy way of doing agile development, so more programming. This comes to an important part. Over one year ago, after last summer, uh, a new colleague joined the team, uh, like we hired someone. His name is Jacob, and he's still my colleague to this day. And on his first day at work, uh, me, Umberto, and Bjarne, and him built our first mob program station at the company. And as you can see there where the big screen is, that's where the pair program station used to be. So we took the pair program station and turned it into a mob program station where we, people can we have a big screen TV, we have a desk where people can see and look, we have a little smaller desk in the corner where the driver can sit and type and the people can be behind them and kind of talk and comment about stuff. So this was the first uh, iteration of that. And it worked pretty, it worked pretty well. Like it, we, we, had some, we had some troubles, but we'll get to it. So this is the first iteration. At some point, this was not good enough. So we went to this. We got an even bigger TV, which is nice. Uh, we did a little arrangement of the desk. We got a whiteboard also, which is also a great thing to have when you're trying to, when words are not enough, then drawing can really help you a lot more. So this is the second uh, iteration. It's, it's pretty good. It was satisfying for quite some time. But at some point we changed office and this is actually how it looks right now. We still have the whiteboard. We have a big desk with many, many keyboards and we have a big screen and that we all program together. We have set up good microphones, good speakers and a good webcam in the case if someone wants or needs to work remotely then they can still join the mob quite. And we have also software to remote control this computer. So anyone working remotely can still join, hopefully, and it's and not have much problems because we have this big Mac Studio machine, which is connected with Ethernet to make sure we have a good low latency and stuff like that. <clears throat> and it works pretty well. Uh, we've had this any, for quite some time. Any, may I say something? Yes, uh, of course. For, for those who go to the uh, book circle and I have been saying that in my previous company in the last office they have a dedicated place <coughs> here here is your dedicated place this is what I meant like when this office was being built this room from the get-go they it was part of the plan to have all of this so it was not improvised as it was in the old office it was from the ground up created to be like that and uh, yeah just wanted to share that for those who who have been to the book circle. This yeah. is what I meant. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's, it's an important part also, right? Because uh, don't let, don't let, so if you look back on the earlier pictures, you can, you can do it with whatever you usually probably have around the office and it can evolve from there. And at some point it can become quite nice. Uh, you just need to, first you need to find out if there's something you want to do uh, and then you can take it from there. But the, not you, any office have probably enough stuff to make it happen. Uh, making what we have right now might be uh, more difficult, right? We have the wall-mounted TV and the desk connect like it's 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 pretty nice. But every it's evolving all the time. Uh, it gets better and better. So it's an important part. Uh, but let's go to the interesting parts. The struggles, because if you think mode programming was 
like we like the book said, more programming is easy. It's easy mode. It is easy mode, but that doesn't mean there's no struggles, because there was, of course, a lot of struggles, and we're going to go through a couple of them. So, in the beginning, it felt kind of slow and frustrating because of a couple of things. First thing is uh, telling someone else what to do is hard. Uh, it can be uh, hard in the sense that you don't feel like you have authority to tell someone else what to do. Like if you're the less experienced person and you want to tell and you want to have something you think is good and then you have the more experienced person and there might be some uh, authority mismatch there. So it's important to for both parts to be open and nice to each other and accepting and kind of find a good level of communication there. Uh, and it's also hard to actually convey your ideas like about code. We're used to typing code on the computer, but once you need to start talking about it, it becomes much harder. Uh, so we had a big problem with this in the beginning and we learned a couple of things that <laughs> using the line numbers is great when you want to point to people in a code base where you want them to look, then you just say the line number. And this took some time for us to figure out and get used to. But it takes it takes time to get good at this and get, uh, get com com comfortable with uh, conveying information in this way. And you will get better at it the more you do it, obviously. Another big problem is that when you should leave the mob, and even though we are mob programming is the foundation of doing stuff together, it doesn't mean that you can't leave the mob and come back to the mob or anything like that. Uh, and then the question was like, when should you leave the mob? Because you might, if you leave the mob, you might feel that you're like, oh, I'm letting, I'm letting them, I'm leaving them behind or something like that. Or uh, it can be hard to figure out when you should leave, or you can be like, feel at the moment, like oh, I'm bored, I'm not contributing, but then be like, maybe I should stay maybe like it's it's hard to figure out when is a good time to to leave them up and stuff like that and the second last thing is it's kind of like exhausting to do this talking with people takes more energy than just tapping on a keyboard it it just does it is exhausting and then like the question is like how do you deal with that uh we try to deal with that by having regular breaks and not having to work long days and stuff like that and uh, so let's just go to the solutions of this. What was the remedy to solve these problems? And the answer is, I'm going to repeat myself in the Agile Manifesto. And I said, face-to-face -face conversation is super important in the Agile Manifesto, and I agree with that. But the only thing that is more, more important, what's equally as important is this last point here. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how they become more effective, then choose and adjust its behavior accordingly. And this is something that I learned from the book Software Teaming by Will Su and his talks. And this is super important. And we start, we did this, and this was what made more program actually work in the long end. That is that at the end of each day, we spent 10 minutes to have a little bit of perspective where we just discussed what went well, what went wrong today. And it was just 10 minutes, but it was enough. Especially in the beginning, we did it often and it helped us tremendously. And we just tried to stop doing or improve the things that was annoying us or being bad and try to do more of the good stuff. And slowly, we just became better and better and better by having this at every day. We just talked a little bit like what went wrong, what could have done better. And that I think, that's the most important thing you can do when you do this. Just talk to each other and keep doing this. So uh, the good habits, what did we get from this? Uh, no, but what are the good habits that we kind of uh, came to? Super important, use a timer, <laughs> rotate the driver and take breaks. This is the most, like this, you, you gotta do this. You gotta rotate. You can't have the same person coding all the time and you can't just skip breaks you must take the breaks uh, you stop what you're doing take the break do something else come back it's fine it is good to do that 
let people express their ideas and try them out. And this is also super important. If you're the more experienced person on the, on the, in the mob, you gotta let the least experienced people uh, try out their ideas. You need to listen to them, even though you might know that this is a bad idea. You might be wrong first. You might be clouded by your experience, uh, or you are maybe also even letting, uh, stopping them from learning in, in an important lesson. Uh, so let them do the mistake, and then you can discuss why why it was a mistake to do it that way, and that will hopefully give them insight to why it was bad. If you just stop them and say this is a bad idea, you will never find out if it was a good idea, and the person will never learn that it, it was not a good idea. So you gotta you gotta you gotta let people express and try them out the ideas. Line numbers is your friend. Like I can't like you, you, it makes everything so much easier to talk about code when you can point at line numbers. Um, Listen and find balance what works for your team is a thing also. And this comes back to the, the retrospective. Like, just you gotta iterate on what makes, you gotta go from, you gotta re reflect on things that doesn't work and do more what works. And don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. You will not get it right. You will not have the perfect environment right away. It will not be perfect, but don't, don't let that stop you. Uh, and don't, yeah. I'm running uh, short on time. <laughs> I see here. <laughs> so I have, this is my last slide. Uh, so did we get what we wanted at Parky when we're doing this? And I think so. Uh, I myself had a hidden agenda when I wanted to do why I wanted to do this. Uh, I got a little pushback from some people uh, in the company uh, and thought this was maybe not a very efficient way to work. And I think it is, and it has been proven to be a more efficient work. So one of the things I wanted to do is have more collaboration between everybody in, in the company, and especially between the iOS people, like the iOS experts and the Android experts, because we had some problems of features being done differently on different platforms and stuff like that. And we couldn't, we were bad at sharing ideas and uh, a lot of simple stuff that was just like, if we work more together, it will maybe be better. And we can hopefully learn some of our backend system also, which is written in Node.js. So we got that, we got more cross-functional teams. Uh, we also reduced the work in progress, uh, which is also something that's not great. If everybody keeps working on the on separate things, uh, then you have, you can have like six, five, 10 things working at the same time. And that might look like a lot of progress is being made, but it's way more efficient to actually work on one thing and get that done fast. And that's also more beneficial for the business, because if the business can release one feature that works, instead of not releasing any features, one feature that works is better than six that doesn't work. Uh, but that has made a huge impact, because then you can get feedback on that feature faster. So you can get it done faster, get it out there, iterate on it. You, I wanted to reduce the lead times, and this comes back to the whole podcast thing we talked about before, like doing stuff asynchronously as a team is not very efficient if you have to wait for people to get answers or get respond like everything takes so much long time and you end up while you're waiting you end up starting new things and then you increase your work in progress and it becomes kind of a little bit of a mess uh, you feel like you're doing a lot but you're not very efficient because we as human we want to we're good at doing one thing at a time Knowledge spreading is the thing that kind of seems obvious as well, right? To when you work together, you're hopefully spreading the knowledge around. And this one was something we struggle with a lot at our company. Like uh, we're not we're not very many people at our company. So if people get sick or go on parental leave, which I'm doing in one week, uh, like the whole team gets affected a lot. But if you work together as a mob, if one person disappears, they probably don't disappear together with the knowledge. Hopefully their knowledge has been spread around by everybody else and it doesn't hit the team as hard if they disappear. They can probably survive pretty well without the person. Might not be as a great of a mob, but they will they will still probably function well. Uh, and this is called the truck factor. It's about what is how many developer can disappear without how many developers can be hit by a truck before everything stops 
Uh, so we were quite, at some point, we were like, I was the only iOS developer in a sense. And so if I got hit by a truck, we had two other developers who had no idea about the iOS code base or anything like that. So that would kind of stop the iOS development. Today, uh, that will not happen. And that's all I've got. Uh, we, have, uh, we have actually a number of questions uh, that people have for you, Kenny. Okay. Uh, number one here, how helpful is the mob programming when we are in a time crunch? I guess deadlines, I mean. Uh, quite a lot. If you look at some companies, right? Uh, this happens a lot, maybe not with time crunch, but it happens with bugs. As, as certain companies, when there's a bug, what usually happens is that everybody start helping each other on fixing this one bug everybody become that's the only time when mob programming happens when there is not a culture of mob programming everybody gets focused on this one critical bugs that needs to be fixed uh, so it kind of comes natural and then time crunch is a little bit different to some extent and it helps in the sense that you, you will not automatically code friend. like my, my important thing here is like you like avoid there's ways to avoid time crunches and mob programming can help with avoid the time crunches better for example is the work in progress like i said it's better to get stuff done faster than having many stuff uh being developed at, at in parallel so that's kind of the focus, like get get one thing done fast and get the next thing done fast and get the next thing done fast and that thing. Instead of having many things working and then you have to crunch all of them because like, uh, like get one thing done and then you can, at any point you can release the product when everything is, is done. So it's more like try to, and this, and since you're only working on one thing at a time, you also kind of force the product owner or the stakeholders to prioritize in like, in which order do you want this stuff like what is the most important thing for you and they have to prioritize if you're working on 10 things one of them things might be important uh, but why are you working on the nine other things if the if the one thing is the most important thing right then they're just taking time from the most important thing so that it's more about focus and that focus can hopefully avoid the time crunch uh, i would say nice uh, dimitris you have uh, you have a question Yes, I do. Thank you, Kenny, for the talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, a bit of, so I have a question, but I will, I'll need to introduce it a little bit with some context. Uh, in my previous work where we, we, we did mob programming uh, for about two years, they still do. I left the company. Uh, the main difference was that we did it remotely. Um, so it was not the classical uh, mob programming. Uh, we were in, we were not on the same computer, but it worked pretty well. And uh, I would say I overall agree with the uh, with your um, benefits and struggles. Uh, I would, however, like to add a few uh, or emphasize a few. So you mentioned in the end, especially the truck effect. Uh, I would totally agree. There is lower pressure in individuals. So now it's not Dimitris who has, you know, who is pinged to fix the feature X. It's the entire team. So if Dimitris leaves like he did, the team continues almost because, you know, everybody is kind of in the know, let's say. Uh, the next one, uh, it was, it is very, it is very good for socializing. Actually, you know, not just programming whenever we're sitting we are having so many discussions and so on for any kind of topic mm -hmm. so it's actually even though we were remote we were super social with each other and i think it's a great uh, way to utilize remote and distributed teams on the struggles so you can leave a comment on that later but i want to get into the struggles that i i didn't hear i would say mob programming will not really work with cross-functional teams and what people usually mean with cross-functional team is like there is people that are that they have very different backgrounds so there's a front-end guy in kotlin and then there is a back-end guy in within embedded and c plus plus like me um if you have such a team it's not gonna work because people 
are like very, they have very different backgrounds, very different speeds. I would say it works mostly with, let's say, so-called component teams, where, of course, not everybody is the same, but they are kind of at the same level. They have the same background. Uh, another thing is that uh, it, there can be either too high or too slow pace, depending on who's driving. And that can be, or who's navigating, however you want to call it. That can be frustrating for some sometimes. Um, extroverts are needed. So if you have a team full of intro introverts, I don't see how it's going to work. It's going to get very awkward. So you need at least a few, <laughs> a few people, some percentage of the team to, you know, push everybody forward and even like force discussions, force people to talk like, okay, what do you think? Otherwise, introverts or having a team with just introverts is going to be very difficult. And the final one, it's I think one of the most interesting. While there is, as we said, no low pressure on individuals, there is also very little satisfaction, you know, with you know, this, uh, how do you call this, this uh, hormone boosts due to personal achievements. There is no longer, you know, Dimitris built this, he did a great job. It's now the team, which is great, you know, has great uh, side effects uh, to the team spirit and you know, the pressure, the truck effect that we said, but, you know, it, it, it gives you like takes away that, you know, it's no longer Dimitris did something because it's usually the entire team that worked on every commit. So but, yeah. I don't know if you have any feedback on that. That was my, uh, it wasn't the question exactly, but not like. It. Yeah, but I, I get you. I, I'll, I'll try to address some of them because I have some uh, thoughts on them uh, and uh, see where I remember all of them. Uh, remote first, like, I believe that uh, being extreme is easy. So if everybody is remote, remote mode programming is easy. And this little tiny book has a lot of good advice how to do it. Uh, or if everybody's on, on site, it's also easy. The hard part is what we're struggling with now that mostly everybody's on site, but sometimes people is remote like me today, for example, or uh, and stuff like that. That's I think that's the hard part when you have to mix uh, on space and remote, because that makes that we who are on, on site, we have an advantage to the people who are remote. They will miss out on uh, little, little small stuff. Uh, so being extreme is the easy part. Mixing is where the hard part comes in. Like, because if someone goes away, they kind of people, yeah. So I agree. It works best, easiest is if you just do one 100%. That would be the easiest. And I do agree, socializing is a, I think I've talked more to my colleagues now than I did when I didn't do it. And you talked about the cross functional thing there. And I, I, I would agree and disagree. Uh, I would say it does work, I believe, but I do believe also that it's hard to convince people because people are stuck in their box, right? Uh, like if we, if we for, for, if I talk from, from my experience now, what are we doing? So we are the iOS developers and the iOS Android experts sitting together and we're learning some and we attempt to do some back end at the same time. We have people who are experts at back end and web front end and hardware stuff. And they're a little bit more reluctant to join the mob. Uh, and we don't need them that often either. So, so it's like, I would love for the backend people to be more part of the mob, but they're not totally convinced yet. And they might also believe that we're so few people, so we can't, we can't uh, mix it up. So it, I do believe it works, but I think it's probably very hard to convince someone who is a C++ uh, expert hardware kind of guy to be like hey let's do some javascript front end stuff right it's like it's you need to be uh, i believe it's possible it's doable and it's, i believe it's a good thing but i'd also believe it that's probably one of the harder things to accomplish and if, if so, sorry if i may add on that i think it also depends on the task because thinking back to our experience if uh, the hardware guy has to work on a story that is pure, let's say, UI Android. Maybe there's not that much they can contribute. But as you might remember, every now and then we had a bug that actually involved hardware, that it, it was a, a bug that actually 
involve the Android device or the iOS device, and at the same time, the hardware. That's where you saw the hardware guys joining and so on, because we could see what what we, from our perspective, what we couldn't see. Like, for example, how is the hardware actually uh, responding when we do these operations? And we were able to obtain that information by the hardware guy being part of the mob. I remember we did that uh, a couple of times. So the story that is worked on has an impact in convincing using the words that have been thrown yeah. to to make other people join. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. Like uh, the mob should be uh, flexible in that sense that everybody doesn't need to be part of the mob all the time, right? Also, uh, so it's it's great if uh, if the if the hardware people, which is kind of what's happening, they're part of it. Some they're part of it. Usually, when there's a problem, which happened just mm. this week, uh, actually. Uh, so, th so that's also like a good way, like they don't have to be part of it all the time, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last point, the introvert things. Uh, I, do, I do believe to some extent that uh, introverts uh, will thrive in a mob programming because you will be with a type, with a group of people that you get become friends with. And this will be your tight, like this will be your tight group. This will be uh, like introverts are more against like if outside people, but you will have your friend group. You will be like in your safe space in a way, right? I'm here with my colleagues that I hopefully like and love to work with, and I'm fine to talk with them. Uh, so I, I think introverts, but I do also agree with you that some introverts might not have the kind of leadership ability to someone taking charge sometimes, which might be needed to be like, okay, what is the next thing we're doing? Someone needs to kind of lead a little bit. And that can maybe be missing if you only have introverts. No one might have that natural intention to, to lead a little bit, which I think might be needed also. So I, I agree with you, uh, Dimitri, and also disagree with some points, I guess. But yeah, you're, you're kind of spot on on some things there. A mm. uh, quick question here, Kenny, from the audience. So mm. uh, if you could mention very quickly, what are some of the tools that you use uh, to do mob programming, but especially when remote? So for example, half is in the office, half is not in the office. What tools do you use to get the work done, basically? Yeah, well, we, we have a special situation, right? Because we work in different kind of environments. So we're mostly doing iOS and Android. We're using Android Studio and Xcode most of the time, which means that we can't like, there's a lot of tools that has this kind of built in. Android has a built in mob programming thing and so does Visual Studio Code and, and other things, but we can't use them because we're switching back and forth between Android and Xcode and even back and sometimes on the fly. So this tool doesn't work, uh, but these two will work for some people. So we're using a screen sharing where you can control someone's computer completely and also talk and share and stuff like that, which is called Tuple. And it works great on Mac. It works okay on Linux and it's just in beta on Windows. But since everybody's using Mac anyways, it was not really a problem for us. So we used Tuple to just, if someone was remote, they could just remote control our computer in the office. And that's how kind of they could be part of the mob in that sense. Uh, but if you're only, if you're completely remote, uh, this talks about like that, there's other tools. And I know the, the some other people at the company, when they do pair program or program, they're using a tool which basically, uh, you just tap a couple of buttons. It has a timer built in, and at some points, it's like it. It makes a commit on, on of all you're working on. It pushes to a separate branch, and then the other person just tap a commando, and it pulls it down, and it starts their screen sharing. So you're just switching who's screen sharing at the moment, and it's just pushing up and pulling down the code through Git with this little tool, basically. And they say it works great, and I've heard people work great. So that's a very good tool if you're. Uh, remote only uh, and it might also be good in that sense that you're then you can use your own stuff you can use your own tool you can use your own keyboard you, uh, keyboard shortcuts you can use your own version of uh, vim emacs android studio whatever you use and stuff like that uh, and instead of us who kind of have to agree on some things that we're because uh, we're using the same computer right so can't go too crazy with some of those configurations exactly uh, nice. Uh, Mega, do you have, uh, sorry, you have a question? Yes, uh, I just want to ask, uh, uh, like you said uh, about the structure of this move programming, 
there is a one person who sits on the screen and the other uh, people around them they navigate the problem so my question is there the person who is sitting on the screen he just write the course only like for example the other person is saying to them okay do like this do like that so what's the input of that person who is like uh, writing the code just he use own idea so maybe he follow the other people idea uh yeah basically they should try to as you say kind of just say do what the other people are saying telling them to do uh, and that can be on many different like if you're more experienced you could just say like oh could you extract a function here or could you uh inline that variable or could you call this function here and stuff like that but it can be also like low level like oh go to line 31 and type uh, val uh, foo equals bar or something like that but that's not all they do they are also of course there to clarify something like they're not they're not allowed to they are allowed to, but they shouldn't come with their own ideas, but they can question their, their ideas to come to some extent. You should say like, what do you mean? Like this, is this how you, how would you kind of do it? And stuff like this. And there's a great tool that we use at work actually, which is called Mobster. And it has a little game built in and there's a, you can, not, you can use it with any other tool. This it has a Git repo to it. Also called uh, Mob RPG. And it's all it does is basically it gives you quests basically and every time you do one of these quests then you get points and you level up and you get different kind of quests and these kind of quests can be like ask the driver ask a clarification clarifying question to the navigators or as a navigator it can be like oh uh, promote someone else ideas with less experience or, or something like that so it gives you little little tasks how to be a good mob uh, we haven't actually tried it work. I have investigated it, and it can might be a be a helpful tool to just find what you should do in the roles. Because what should never happen is the driver should drive on their own, right? Because then everybody else would be lost. And if there's mm -hmm. if they're really good and really fast at programming, also everybody would get lost even faster. Uh, so sorry, just to add a little bit on what Kenny said. So basically, the strategy is very much what we do in class, in which I'm always the driver. And what do I tell you guys? Hey, tell me what is your solution? And I always ask, is this what you mean? So it's basically the same dynamic. And just elaborating on what Kenny said, the idea is because if you're a navigator, you're not, not allowed to touch the keyboard. That means that there's only one way you are able to transmit your idea, and that is speaking. And by speaking, you are then, again, sharing that knowledge and making sure that everyone, everyone else um, it's on the same line, if you will, about the idea being expressed. As Kenny said, if the driver, if the driver, the one in the keyboard is typing everything, then that person will not be transmitting this information to the rest of the audience. And that is why it is so important. And that's why I tell you all of you, you have to become comfortable at expressing your ideas correctly, which is what Kenny said. Uh, if you do not, as an example, reference line numbers, or if you do not express yourself carefully because you don't know the terminology, it's going to be very difficult for you to communicate with your, yeah, with your colleagues. And that's why we emphasize a lot on that aspect of what is it that you really mean? I know what you mean, but you're not saying what you mean. So what is it that you mean? Because that's where it comes into play, basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with that too. But it's, it's hard also, right? Remember that. Mm -hmm. We have another question, almost done, uh, two minutes, but one question here. It's uh, The question is, is mob programming already integrated within Agile or are the companies currently implemented with the way of functioning? I don't, I didn't understand the second part, but the first part, Kenny, is mob programming like an actual thing that it's spoken in Agile or what is the relationship? You spoke a little bit about that. The relationship yes. between mob and agile yes so to be clear to some there are no agile practices to some extent right there are just practices that has evolved from the agile uh, mindset or the the agile uh, uh, manifesto so there there is no agile practices but mob programming is a very agile practice uh, so to speak so if you're doing more programming, you're probably automatically adhering to a lot of the values of, of, of Agile. So when someone's saying like, we're doing Agile, 
that's wrong. You can't do agile. You can only be agile. Uh, so, so it's um, I th just when it comes to the word agile, there's a lot of confusion around there in the world. And there, if you're doing Scrum, it doesn't mean that you're agile at all. Uh, you can basically be very little agile by doing Scrum and doing this safe, which is also uh, popular by big companies. It doesn't mean that you're agile. Uh, you have to be agile to be agile. And I just mean you have to you just have to read the manifesto to some extent and base your value, like make your decisions based on those values, basically, right? And that's how more programming, that's why more programming is very an agile practice because it's it aligns with the values of the agile, uh, basically. I hope I answered the question to some extent. Yeah, I, I, I believe you did. So, so Mina, basically, it's not that agile says you have to use mob. No, mob is just a an activity or an action that because of how it was uh, like created, it not satisfies, but it aligns with the Agile manifesto. So they are aligned, but it's not that Agile tells you you have to do mob <laughs> in any way. Exactly. Maybe, in, maybe in 10 years from now, there's another methodology that is totally different from mob, uh, but it still aligns with Agile. Agile. So yeah. yeah, exactly. Like values and principle will, will survive with time but practices must adapt, right? Mm. That's why there are no practices. Like mm. 20 years ago, pair programming was the important thing. And that is kind of, now we're doing pair programming and more programming and, and so on, right? The practices to change with time. Mm. And just to wrap up, Kenny, what will be mm. the magic number? What is the best ideal number when people do uh, programming? What's the magic number? <laughs> I think the magic number is either four or five if i get to four pick two because if you take four as a magic number it means if one person leaves the mob you're still a mob because you're three people left mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if it's so i say four is the magic number if one person joins you're five people which is not too much also right so i say four four is the magic number because if someone leaves you're still good if someone comes along and joins the mob you're still good because uh, exactly. more than six becomes can be a lot of people, right? It can be too much. I say four is the magic spot, and people can leave and join without it being any problem at all. Of course, exactly. it's just what I think. Nice, nice. Okay, so I don't want to be disrespectful with anyone's time. Hopefully, everyone really, really enjoyed uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, once again, Kenny, thank you very much for for joining us, for taking the time, and for sharing your your experience. I'm very sure that uh, after this presentation, people are going to be more motivated. And for those who are in the internship, now you have an idea to push into your current company. Maybe you should be doing some. Uh, mob programming so with that said thank you everyone and uh, yeah i would then see you either on lecture or help sessions thank you everyone yeah thank, thank you, you too everyone hey do bye bye hey do have a good day bye bye hey do thank you for today <laughs>